Hi, I want to welcome everyone to the Museum of Television and Radio. My name is David Bushman, and I'm television curator here. Uh, Strangers with Candy ran for three seasons on Comedy Central and was the network's first original non-skit series, live action. This extraordinarily bold and innovative show dubbed the unholy spawn of Get a Life and My So-Called Life by salon media critic Joyce Millman was a breath of fresh air subverting almost every conceivable television convention with characters who were unapologetically insensitive, politically incorrect, self-absorbed, and devoted to immediate, immediate gratification rather than the deeper moral consequences. Strangers with Candy was a brilliant and wicked satire of television that promises easy answers and pat solutions to life's complex challenges. The show was hailed by critics nationwide, and I don't have to tell everyone here tonight, developed an intensely passionate legion of followers who still mourn its untimely passing. All of this is why we're very pleased here at the museum tonight to celebrate the show and to pay tribute to the cast and creative team, not only for all the laughter they gave us, but also for their contribution to television lore. Our first panelist was an independent writer, producer, and director before working on Michael Moore's TV Nation as a senior producer. He went on to spend four years of, as head of East Coast Development at Comedy Central, where he executive produced several shows, including The Upright Citizens Brigade and Strangers with Candy. Please welcome Kent Alterman. Our next panelist portrayed Flatpoint High principal Onyx Blackman, a role written specifically for him by the creators of Strangers with Candy, including our uh, final three panelists, all of whom he met while performing with Chicago's Second City main stage troupe. He also wrote and performed in the two-man play Revelations, Indictments, and Confessions, and appeared in the film Time Served. Please welcome Greg Holloman. Our next panelist was a creator, co-producer, and writer on Strangers with Candy, and also starred as Flatpoint's counter-inspirational history teacher, Chuck Noblet. After moving to New York, he co-developed Exit 57, and also worked as a writer and cast member on The Dana Carvey Show. He's appeared on Spin City and written for Saturday Night Live, and is well known to Comedy Central viewers as a correspondent on the now Peabody-winning program, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Please welcome Stephen Colbert. Our next panelist was a creator and writer on Strangers of Candy and also performed in the series as the genteel, self-absorbed art teacher, Jeffrey Jelinek. After moving to New York from Chicago, he co-developed Exit 57. He's appeared in several films and television programs and appears frequently on New York stage, most notably in Stitches. Please welcome Paul Donello. Our next panelist was raised in North Carolina and moved to Chicago to pursue, pursue a comedy career at Second City. She's written for Exit 57 with Stephen and Paul and has written and produced numerous plays with her brother David, including the Obie Award-winning One Woman Shoe and the current critically acclaimed The Book of Liz, which has been extended due to popular demand. She was a creator and writer on Strangers with Candy and starred at the, as the incomparable Jerry Blank a 46-year-old ex-boozer, user, and loser who returns to Flatpoint High School as the world's oldest freshman after 32 years from home living a very colorful life. Please welcome Amy Sedaris.
<laughs> no. We invited a lot of empty seats. Okay, we're going to ask a few questions, and then we're going to go to the audience, and then we'll go to the pilot. But uh, can you talk about how this program got started, what the origins of it were, and what you were trying to accomplish with the show? Uh, goes for the creators, I guess. Well, <laughs> as the co-producer, um, we had, uh, I don't know, we'd done X57 together. We'd worked for Second City together, and we'd worked together for years, and done X57, and then when that got canceled, we wanted to work together again, and Amy had and always wanted to do... else that would get canceled. Exactly. <laughs> Amy wanted, always wanted to do an after-school special, and, but well, there wasn't much more That's uh, too old. to that yet. And she always wanted to do an after-school special as a show. And so when she went to Comedy Central to pitch it, she said, would you help us? And that was it. There, end of story. <laughs> oh, and, <laughs> no, and, and, we, and we found, found this other video. Yeah, from, it was made in the late 60s. It, it was about a, um... <laughs> it was called The Trip Back. It's a little Severia. Uh -huh. uh, trip Back, um, <clears throat> yeah, about, about a, like a 50-year-old woman who uh, um, was a junkie and, like, she was from Long Island and became a prostitute and a junkie, and then she was on the road to recovery, and she'd go to high schools and talk. And the woman reminded me of Amy. <laughs> <laughs> and the best thing about the woman was that she would go to high schools and just yell. She'd sit by yeah, the table awful. and chain smoke and yell at students. <laughs> you, the Negro in the vest. With the bees. With the bees. I know what you're doing. I know what you're into. I'm no, I was hip. I was fly. I was dope. <laughs> I was one smart cookie, and I couldn't get away with it. Exactly. I woke up on Dope Street with a needle in my arm. <laughs> we liberally, we liberally uh, took direct quotes from this woman and put them in the show. Well, we took her entire <laughs> life. When we actually took every quote, the, the, the writing process slowed down. <laughs> and so we combined those two things into a 46-year-old high school freshman. And the thing we really wanted was for no one at the school to pay any attention to the fact that she was 46. Over the course of 30 shows, no one ever says, hey, that woman's 46. Um, it just is completely accepted, and uh, I guess the one and the one goal for um, was for everyone to be self-involved, which I think we achieved. Yeah, everyone's first thought to be of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> How about the characters? Have you been playing a variation of uh, Jerry already? Oh, uh, yeah, so it's the only character I have. It's the same. <laughs> I like to think of her as that kind of actress who isn't versatile, you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, I'm going to play a junkie this this time, or, you know. Yeah. So I just changed the background, but they always look the same. The character always looks the same. You know? So. Anybody else? Well, it's an incredibly easy character for, to write for, too, because the voice is so strong that mm -hmm. it's easy to get into the voice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say by the end of the show, Amy was really starting to get the character nearly as good as Steven. I know, I forgot. <laughs> like, well, how does she sound again? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Put the gun down. <laughs> so you guys coming, uh, I want to ask about the other characters, but coming from an improvisation background, how much of what we saw was scripted and how much were you guys making up as you went along? We always show? had a script, but we played around a lot in front of the camera. And a lot of it got in the show. He did. When yeah, they weren't did. around, he always. <laughs> Ever. But uh, when they weren't on set, it was all improvised. We used, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Amy, Amy, Amy would always do the scene, but then at the end of it, she would just keep going, and they wouldn't turn off the camera, and usually she would do something better than we yeah. thought of. She had special messages for the standards and practices. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to share one with us now, Amy? <laughs> no, I go, <clears throat> no. <laughs> Amy. Well, the scripts were all written through, like, improvisation, I'd say. Yeah, like, we, we all stood up the characters. We'd outline, like, um, we'd outline the show and get the beats, and then we would just go, this is what happens in this scene, and then we'd improvise it, and then... And if we, l we had a sort of this, I don't know if it was unspoken or spoken, I certainly spoke it in my head, um, <laughs> uh, was that uh, uh, we'd all worked on shows where you had... You'd write something funny, and everybody would be laughing, and then we'd sort of get exhausted from the laughing. And go, OK, but what do we put in the script? We can't really say that in the script. And so our, our little unspoken rule was whatever made us laugh would go into the script, regardless of whether it was something you could put in a script. And God bless Comedy Central, we couldn't believe the things they didn't stop oh us from God. doing. <laughs> we were I, like, I remember uh, 
I was in the room when you guys were writing, when you said, uh, uh, well, hey, I thought you were, uh, no, no, I like the pole in the hole. <laughs> I'm going to take your pinky and make it all stinky. <laughs> and I was laughing, I was cracking up, but I didn't know you guys were going to put that in there. And when I saw it in the show, I was like, we didn't, we didn't either, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> Amy said, I need something to end this scene with. And so we gave her a list of, like five different things you can say, one of which was, I'm gonna make your pinky out. Thank you. <laughs> and, but we said yeah, specifically, we her, you must an get option. another take besides uh, that. Uh, you uh, must, uh, absolutely. Uh, and then we watched uh, five different takes of pinky out stinky. <laughs> pinky out stinky. Five. Pinky out stinky. <laughs> Yeah. Amy! I was in London at that time, and there was a conference call between myself and uh, I think myself. Eileen Katz, who was the head of pro programming, who was, was here key tonight, person actually. In getting the show on the air. Um, and I think the standards and practice per person, the head of business affairs legal part, and the head of uh, communications and press, all about that scene. And uh, line, really. the more we talked about it, the more everyone realized, like, of course, it's perfectly OK. And so it got on the air. <laughs> after you say the word banana, after a while, yeah. it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> banana, <laughs> innocuous. So in general, there was not a lot of uh, difficulty getting stuff by, the, by Comedy Central. Well, th there was a lot of discussion always. But I think uh, the, the woman who heads up standards and practices, who couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately, who was a big fan of the show it, named Renee Presser, she was really good about always looking at sort of the big picture and what was the context. And once we had created these characters, if we were faithful to who those characters were, then she, she gave us a lot of leeway. So there were some things that we could do. The only do. thing I remember that they said no to, we, we came up with the line first. I don't know why. We just said it minutes left. And the line was, that albino ran off with the midget. No, <laughs> that albino stole my dwarf. Oh, that's what it was. That albino stole my dwarf. So then we said, well, naturally, we need an albino and a dwarf. So, and, uh, so they started doing, uh, John, who would do the casting, started looking for, like, around New York area for albinos, for available albinos and dwarves. Not many, unfortunately. No, not many. But we found some, and then Comedy Central, for some mysterious reason, said, you cannot have an albino and a dwarf. Like, yeah. we're, uh, <laughs> so offend, like, the uh, albino, albino and dwarf, dwarf community. <laughs> yeah. So we had and to change the line, quotas. too. You know, there's quotas for these things, and there had already been a lot of albinos and dwarves on the man show. <laughs> so I think they were used up for that week. So we had to change the line to, that madman took my hobo. <laughs> Don't have the same kind of ring. Which I heard rippled, the laughter rippled across the country. Yeah. Rippled. On that one. And Never filthy Jew diary. Yeah. They wouldn't let us say filthy Jew diary. We could say dirty Jew diary, right? <laughs> You're out of context. That doesn't get any laughs in this room either. So. Um, oh, and also, uh, there were two things. We had, we had one, the one character that I think we all really wanted to get into a script that we never got into a script. And uh, we got mild resistance at first. And then we brought them around. We eventually had to cut it for, for time. Was um, in the episode where the boy, the blind boy, wants to become a member of the football team, he gets a lawyer from a, a, a law firm oh, that right. only represents the disabled. <laughs> and all the lawyers are disabled also. And this particular Mentally. lawyer's disability is that he's retarded. <laughs> turn it up! Turn it up! <laughs> we never found no. a place for that character. <laughs> Another thing I, I think that drove us, apart from just stuff that seemed funny was uh, sort of the underpinnings of the show, which was that we all grew up in this country with school. I mean, I personally went to Robert E. Lee High School, home of the champions, in San Antonio, Texas. And I wanted to do something that would honor the people who helped shape me in such a <laughs> really great, constructive I'm way. the champions do this year, 0-6. Yeah. Six. yeah. <laughs> we saw sort of dumbass name, the, the champions. champions. We right. lost again. Oh, too bad for the champions. <laughs> no, we were actually the volunteers. Champions, champions lose. lose. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think that, you know, we all have, growing up with such respect and reverence for authority, we, we wanted to be able to do something that would tweak the, the authority that we all grew up with. And I think that's part of what people relate to. 
And also the idea of after school specials, which were these, you know, high morality tales where this awful problem would be presented and then sewn up. In the first 30 seconds. Right. And then at the end, it's all, everything's fine. And I think the idea of An animal of, dies and then everything's fine. Right. After the, and there is no father and everything's fine. Right. right. And the alcoholism. <laughs> And so we just set out to have a morality tale each week where that you just learn the wrong lessons, and, or at least that one over there did. <laughs> you know, you hear people talk about, when you read about the show, people talk about the show Get a Life often. Is that something that anybody... The guy with Corky, Get a Life, the really retarded boy? No, no, no. <laughs> That's life goes on. Oh, what's your question? I guess it is so answered. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. I love that show. <laughs> Yeah, we heard that. We saw that in reviews sometimes. Anything? Do, do, was that something that I, I guess I know? That was the one with Chris Elliott, isn't it? Right. Oh, that one. I was, I was familiar with it. I was familiar with the, co the concept, but I don't think I ever watched I never it saw that it. many times. That, was, that's, that show, as far as I can remember, and I, I didn't watch that many of it, was sort of... It was of, canceled, uh, that one. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. But it, it played lived. on the convention of sitcoms. Yeah. And uh, so I suppose we had that in common, is that we were playing on television conventions, yeah. and we gave wrong messages. <laughs> the right. right way. But no, it wasn't a model. Right. Okay, well, let me just uh, extrapolate on that a little bit. The last book that I've really read on, like, sort of the trace, the development of history was the Tony Hendra book, uh, Going Too Far, I think it's called, which takes it up to baby boomer humor and sort of traces the evolution of the, the uh, going Baby to boomer humor. From, like, gag-oriented humor to the more uh, topical and uh, more media referential uh, of humor of people like Saturday Night Live and so on. I'm just wondering, like, I'm getting a lot of blank looks, so I'm not sure if anybody's knows that. But. A book? No, you read a book. <laughs> <laughs> we all. Yeah, that, yeah, right. That. <laughs> 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 I'm wondering where you guys and, and Amy have seen um, uh, where humor has come from that point of, say, Saturday Night Live when it first started. Like, what has happened to comedy since that time? And where do you see your, your humor and your show's humor sort of fitting into that evolution? I think it's... <laughs> Well, I don't know or where we reverence. fit, but I would say uh, humor is, um, you can be darker now than yeah. you used to be, and the audience will come along with you. For instance, like, I think of pops to mind is George Costanza buying the, the cheap envelopes and his, and his fiance yeah. dies. And that was the season ender. And that's an incredibly dark way. I think it was dark for, even for that show, but that's something you couldn't have gotten away, certainly even when Saturday Night Live started. Um, that's the only difference I can see. I mean, First thing that comes to mind is. Was Saturday Night Live something that any any of you watched? Uh, yeah, I liked SCTV when I was little. SCTV, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that because the sets always look cheap, and you know, I mm -hmm. like let's put on a show feel to right. it. It didn't look so overly produced. Me too. I guess when I was the first, because um, I remember before that I used to think I used to like Rich Little a lot. Yeah. And. Um, <laughs> 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 but I, I used to watch I'm that. Richard Nixon. Right, and he would do his. <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty much like, that was like as a reverend. And then there was this SNL, and you're going, man, that's like, that's completely the next level. Like, because the first, I remember the first sketch they had was like Nixon and um, Kissinger praying, remember? Um, mm -hmm. at, like weeping and praying. Yeah. And like, it was so it's... far removed from like, you know, how sanitary Rich Little's sort of thing was. Or it was such a caricature, and this seemed like so much darker. But so that I seemed think like a big turning point, I think. I think, you know, and especially when SNL started, it was so much about social and political and cultural satire. <clears throat> and I think a lot of television especially, and humor in general, started becoming about television. And ironically, even this, though this show has, you know, some roots in, like, the after-school special convention, I think we were really looking more at just sort of authority and, you know, tweaking that in general. And um, to me, the, you know, there's the exceptions. Like SCTV was all about TV, but it was really satirical about TV and they had great characters. But so much of comedy has become about TV and I think that it sort of falls short of where We, we actually go. made a concerted effort doing this and X57 before it was not to make real world references. And the closest we come in this is like, you know, the 
uh, miracle worker kind of reference, but I can't think of another no, we in 30 play, episodes. Like, we never pop mentioned real places. Know about pop culture. Yeah, we kept it fictitious. And plus, it was nice about it is um, like the props department and, and music and the costumes. It was everything was so crafted. We all thought the same way. Like you completely trusted each department. Like oh, that person will take care of that, and they were always right on. You know I what I mean? I didn't I trust the that. craft services people. Though. Oh, craft services. <laughs> no. But it was the first time I've ever worked on something like that, where everyone just had the same mind and. <laughs> the same spirit. There was, yeah, an yeah. incredible, this sounds probably really cheesy, but there was an incredible collection of people who came together on this show in all different directions who b both had real passion for it. There was a real family atmosphere, but also uh, creatively, there was just such a nice, creativity could come from every direction on this show. Now, so was that just a matter of luck that, that everybody got together, or was that because of the way I you guys I think it's a testament ran? to them yeah. right there, yeah. Okay. Um, just getting back to characters for a second, Paul, we're going to see the pilot later, but your character actually changed from the pilot to the, when the show went Got on. Got less gay. Well, <laughs> you, you, were the, you were the librarian. It's just the, um, yeah. a testament to my inability to have a consistent performance. <laughs> <laughs> um, our, I think Steven and I's characters were just, they were, we were more trying to fill out, after we had Amy's character, we wanted to fill this stool, school with like... Stool. stool. <laughs> With like, you know, with, with archetypes, so, and I had like a gentle art teacher, and we wanted to have like a sort of a straight history teacher, and the gay stuff was just, it was... Just gravy. Less, just gravy. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a real desire. It was, um, we liked the idea of, um, like it was adults... Just subtext, you know, Adults having the this service. secret, you know? It was just, we liked the idea that they had a, a secret more than plain... Um, the gayness of it, although... No one asked you about the gayness, you just brought that up. <laughs> Why does he keep insisting on talking about that? <laughs> and how about, how about Greg's character? That was a character that was written specifically for Greg? Well, we started, when we started writing the pilot, we, uh, uh, we started doing the voice, and then we realized, wait, we're doing Greg Holloman. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> audacity, hubris, overwinning pride. <laughs> Uh, so we thought, well, we should call Greg, and uh, we were lucky to get him. Yep. But that's how it happened, is we realized we had all the, we had the character completely crafted before we realized we were doing Greg. Mm -hmm. And then we said, okay, well, we got Greg, and then... I don't sound like Greg. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. You do when we're done with you. I'm glad for the character, because I was sitting at home doing nothing. <laughs> I'm glad you called. <laughs> kind of flush. Since we're talking about characters, can we quickly introduce the sure. characters? Sure, yeah, right here? yeah, great. Go, go uh, ahead. Uh, Deborah Rush played uh, Jerry. <laughs> like that? Oh, she is? Yeah. And Maria Thayer. Oh, Wait. Tammy Little Knight. Tammy Little Knight. <laughs> looking good, looking good. <laughs> Lark Spees. What was the brother's name? What was your real name? I always called you Faggot. Derek. Derek. Because Derek. Oh, Derek. <laughs> we loved his name so much at one point. Oh, Lark. When we were first writing, we had always oh, names got to be Lark. Because that's we thought that was the greatest name. And uh, Jack Berber played uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Tickles. Tickles. Jimmy Tickles. Jimmy Tickles. Jimmy Tickles. Jimmy Tickles. Jimmy Tickles. Jimmy Tickles. Iris Puffy Boy. Oh, Iris Puffy Boy. Iris Puffy Who actually was an Olympic hurdler in the, what, 52, 52? Olympics? Is that what it was? Wow. The Helsinki Games. The Helsinki Games. Amazing. Oh, and Mark O'Donnell. Mark O'Donnell played one of the um, twins. Cr crazy twin twins in the library. Mark? <laughs> I have two other quick questions. It's Matt Lappin, who um, also wrote on the show with us. <laughs> and and where's Eileen? And Eileen? Eileen, <laughs> who was president of Comedy Central when uh, she was responsible for the show being launched. 
I just won more Victoria Farrells back there somewhere. Get she a was costume. a costume designer. Yeah. Now, getting back to Chuck Knoblet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you had me. <laughs> I, I actually was going to ask Amy a question, but. Um, Aries. Is there, that's all right. Stephen will answer if you can answer that. No problem. <laughs> there's, uh, there's so much uh, emphasis on in television, on sitcoms, in uh, attractive people and portraying in. in, uh, in, in <laughs> And here's the character you took and deliberately made unattractive. But she thought physically. she was pretty. Right. Right. I like that when someone thinks they're really attractive, but maybe they have some problem areas, you know? <laughs> if I could change one thing about myself, you know, I wanted a different body type. So Vicky had some fatty suits made for me, and I put that fake nicotine on my teeth. Some circles, which I have now. I didn't have then. And an $1,800 wig. But, but was there, why, why, why do that? Was it because you like that sort of the whole idea of her not knowing? Or was there some Amy, why don't point? you lay down on that couch back there? <laughs> <laughs> really? No. It's just more interesting to me. You know, you, you see enough pretty people on TV, and I just, it's just, you know, this, that's just not what she was about. But I prefer to have someone look a little unattractive, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it goes far back. I don't know. <laughs> It's just the way. But the important thing is that she thought she was attractive right. and easy. <laughs> Very easy. I'd say the, our favorite thing for me, and I think maybe for Paul too, in writing the char Amy's character was that um, she was really innocent. She's an incredibly innocent character for all of her life experience. None of it stuck to her. She's a completely Teflon. Everything just <laughs> slipped right off of her, and she approached every situation as if she'd never been there before, even though she'd been in every possible situation. And also, I think that e even though she'd had all this incredible street and horrible experience in her life, really the main thing that sort of motivated her and she was, was her naivete. You know, she was always incredibly naive, and that was, I think, really worked well. And easily hurt for someone so cruel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And ugly. And ugly. And ugly. <laughs> Hideous. Uh, um, let me ask this question. Do you all have favorite seasons of the show or favorite episodes? Did the show... Oh, yeah. Starting with comparing season one and season two and season three, was the show operating better? Was everyone working better? Uh, Ken? <laughs> I think that the whole thing from beginning to finish was a painless, easy joy. <laughs> really, for everyone involved. There was so never any tension, was it's, there, it's hard, Yeah, no. And it's really hard to uh, discern that there was ever any difference. It was just so evenly keeled, you know, throughout the series. Well, now, I think, I, mean, I think that we probably all have favorites here and there, um, but I, I wouldn't categorize it. I, personally, I think the show got better as it went along, and I think significantly better in the third season that even though that there were, in the first two seasons, there were great highlights, both parts of shows and episodes that really stood out. But in terms of like a consistency, I felt like we really started getting it in the third season, and uh, then we were canceled. <laughs> Greg, what's your favorite show? You I have a few favorite shows. The favorite show was the Virginity uh, episode. For personal reasons. And the, re <laughs> <laughs> the retard episode. <laughs> And the one where uh, the track meet when you get had beards. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was a Sean uh, Penn look. And the and the racism episode. Yeah. yeah. Stephen. Uh, Indian. Uh, oh, yeah. the Indian, I think, was the one that uh, felt the nicest. No re no regrets over you know any of the scenes, and it all came out exactly the way we imagined, and that's the hardest part. Uh, is in TV, I think the hardest part is you, w you work on a script for a long time and then it gets shot and then you're done. You don't like get to do it again the next night on stage. And that's it and it exists and that's why it's going to exist forever. But with Indian, no regrets, just shot, shot for shot. Just thrilled with it. Mm -hmm. And we lost seven minutes. We had to cut seven minutes from it. We still were so happy with it. Yeah. <clears throat> I like Raisin in the Sun, although <laughs> it was better on paper. I mean, we had some. It was. No, I think. I then when we finally shot it, but I always liked raising the song. Why were you laughing? Fine. Yeah, why were you laughing? Because you brought the uh, <laughs> you brought to a standstill. <laughs> <laughs> and baby, and, and I, I thought baby. we um, never reached our potential. 
lectures. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. It was like crapshoot. We never really knew. Like sometimes, and sometimes we didn't know why. Like beauty episode. Never. Well, that one we knew was a stinker from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was Do you bad. think we'll ever see these characters again? Do you? What do you mean? <laughs> Tonight, Do maybe, any... David? <laughs> um, <laughs> easy. <laughs> maybe. We have no immediate plans, but yeah, we maybe don't. we'd like would to you, Would you like to bring Jerry Blank back? Yeah. Yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> we're, yes. we're talking about maybe writing a film, but... Um... I think we're going to write a film. <laughs> I hope that, some of you out there have a checkbook. people that will go see it if it's made. What about uh, television? Would you all, do you have any current plans or would you work again in television? I like doing stuff for Comedy Central because like this show, if it was a network show, they probably would have aired two shows and canceled it. At least with Comedy Central, they let you fail for three seasons. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they don't do that anymore in TV. They panic and then or sometimes they don't even air the episode. So mm -hmm. We I had mean, the luxury of a lot of freedom in mm -hmm. a, a lot of places where you work. We wouldn't get that luxury, and now we're spoiled. And that way, I mean, we, they really let us just, you know, we'd hand them whole full scripts, and then there'd be, like, just some tiny notes usually, um, but nothing major. So we got to pretty much do what we wanted. Um, and I doubt... That'll ever happen again. Yeah. <laughs> really? It's, like, just an But it may. We thought that with X-57. We thought we'd never yeah, have that freedom right. again. So you'd work, <laughs> you'd you'd work again for Comedy Central. I'll take some questions from the audience. Anybody? Questions? Yes, in the middle. Any plans for a box set or, or anything? Someone just asked me that at Kim's. I don't know. I just talked to someone at Comedy Central about it. I, we, they should, you know, because a lot of people ask about it. We don't it. really have control, and we don't have um, <laughs> in our possession any quality tapes, unfortunately. <laughs> so we we I know, would do we it don't. ourselves. We don't. We're like 12th generation tapes they gave us. So and with if we had like the beta version or something, we would do it. What's that? With people auditioning on them. You know, yeah. on something else. Right, yeah. wedding. Stephen's wedding tape and another episode. So I know, I guess it's a question for Comedy Central. Um, Who hates us. Yep. As a creative team, are you guys currently doing it all together or planning on We're going to work on a book together for Hyperion. We're going to, we're, and yeah. we're working on another film. Yeah. We'll all be in it, and Paul will direct it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd like to know who the hardest character was to write. Oh, I know the answer to that. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 one second. Give me a hint. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It was at one time the easiest character to write, and then it became incredibly Hard. difficult. And, and the reason we wrote him out is because we couldn't, it was become like, oh, we got to write bits for dad. <laughs> because he had to have all, he had to, we had to have all these things he can do, like all this movement, but then when you, you know, you'd catch him, he'd be like. <laughs> <laughs> so it became really difficult to do after a while. So we said, well, we got to kill him. <laughs> That'll be fun, because that's the answer to everything. And that's a good after school spent death, dealing with that. Yeah, and we wanted to have a death in the family anyway. So yeah, that was. He was that was the one that got candidate. my mom uh, to stop watching. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I like it. It's good, it's good, yeah. it's good. I just, I'm, I'm just a little worried. <laughs> his, uh, that guy, the guy, Roberto Gary, who played Guy, his audition tape was the greatest. Yeah. Because really his audition true. tape was... <laughs> You got it! Because <laughs> ironically, he was the only one who auditioned that actually could do that and mm -hmm. hold it. Yeah, we had like six people. Yeah, because they were, hold still. Like, were all over 70 and they couldn't do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or we had, this one, we had this one guy, he just kind of like aimlessly wandered around the room while the camera, oh, camera yeah. went. She kept going, please sit down and do this. And he just couldn't, I don't know. I, what was that guy who yelled, no, no, no. <laughs> Difficult, on his, on his picture, it's a difficult, difficult, difficult. That's what the casting director wrote on there. There's a guy through in the corner. Okay, sure, go ahead. Uh, how do you feel about the quality of comedy on the Mad TV show? I've never seen the Mad TV show. Um, I've heard good things about it. I love the magazine. People do. Growing up, I love the magazine. 
Yeah, me too. I love it too. The, the people who want it are all very talented. I, I'm not a huge fan of parody. So yeah, it seems mostly like parody. mostly parody, and we try to, uh, not that what we do is better, but we always try to do something <laughs> different. It's just that what they do is less good, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and we're more better. Is that the one of the lady who plays the, clean, the Korean dry cleaning lady? Uh, I think so. Oh, she's so funny. I mean, that's, that's all part of that one. Yeah, I haven't seen too many episodes, but yeah, those individual people are funny, the ones I've met. Yeah. All the way in the back up there. Um, this question, I mean, this question is for Greg. Um, oh, go in ahead. <laughs> in the pot smoking episode? Yeah, you were doing a lot of uh, roller skating, skating backwards. And stuff right, like right. Is that all special effects? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's just uh, one ability. That's, yeah, that's one thing. He's I can't, like, I'm one of those guys, I can't play basketball, I can't play baseball, I can't play sports, you know. I was in a commercial with Michael Jordan one time. He dogged me out because I can't play basketball. <laughs> but I, I do do long distance roller skating. <laughs> so it I is just, sweeping the nation. You know, <laughs> it used to, now, and I still roller skate where everybody else roller blades, but I, I roller skate, so that's one thing I could do. No, no special effects. <laughs> they wanted to have Orlando on my back, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to, uh, when we used to go on tour, we would go, we would play like these small towns in the south. In Pennsylvania. Yeah, with all like these scared white people. And, uh, and as soon as we got to the hotel, Greg would put on these big roller skates and, and these big headphones and these, he had like this, this yellow tiger sweat, stripe sweatsuit and then he'd be, you know, going down the road past these restaurants at about 40 miles an hour and they'd be, you know, Dragging their children off the street. <laughs> You're like enormous. He's six six and stocking feet, and then those skates on. Made a, yeah, he looked yeah, alien esque. Esque. <laughs> yep, right there. Um, just a quick question for I guess Amy. Uh, at the beginning, Jerry started out to be sort of somebody who would wear something that, that would wear. That somebody who would own snakes would wear something like that, right? That's mm -hmm. what he said in the interview. What I was wondering was, towards the end, towards the third season, you seem to get a little more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit rocky, yeah. That was the clip tape, too, it starts to apparent. Was that something that was conscious? Was that to save the show, or do you think that's sort of... To save out? the show. <laughs> <laughs> Our ratings increased. They like it hot. No, that's something uh, Victoria just, you know, she's... just she's... a character evolving, I think, naturally evolving. We watched, uh, we watched uh, season two, and we saw, actually, at one point, I think Ken pointed this out, there was a particular scene in one of the episodes, and we said, that's the perfect face for her, or that's, that's, sort, of, that's sort of like the tone of her character. It's not so far that it's distracting, but it's also horrific. And also, <laughs> no, but really, it was sort of a balance, is that you wanted people to listen to her, but sometimes she was so ugly that all you were looking at was her teeth. And there was a difference, there's a difference between feeling like that that really was her face or was she wearing a clown or face? some mask yeah right. right and i think the more it felt like that it was <laughs> some that hideous, the hideous hideous like mask hers. <laughs> <laughs> and i do think that that was a challenge for some people you know as you pointed out earlier people are used to seeing attractive people in conventional terms on tv and i think a lot of people were repulsed by what they saw <laughs> they, they, they were and it took i have people they, they'd say all right i, I can't look at her Canceled. face it doesn't matter now <laughs> <laughs> i always wanted to go uglier and they're always like yeah but um but i think that it did t take it took a certain commitment from people then to go past that and then realize what was there you know and those are the real lovers yeah they're <laughs> here tonight yep over there um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for all the hours of pleasure and delight. It's I'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> Here's how, this you. is why we went with pleasure and delight. Uh. <laughs> well, thank you thank for you. watching. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Other than the uh, after school specials, were there any kinds of uh, teen episodic series that influenced um, your writing? Scooby Doo. <laughs> My so called life. Yeah, my yeah. so called life was one. And we rented after school specials. Whenever, they're hard to get, but. What else besides my so called life and after school specials? Was it uh. was, no, it wasn't always purposeful, but we would, um, we would write a script and set it aside for a few months, and then we would, uh, or, or rather, we would see an after school special and then write a script a few months later, and then we might see the after school special and go, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, do a search and replace for those words. <laughs>
and because uh, we loved them so much, there was it was hard to beat sometimes the structure that they put forth. You can rent anything right now at the museum. Of <laughs> oh, we came here. And, uh, we actually yeah, we came, came here. here to write the pilot. And Lifetime has, you know, the movies now are so great. They're after school specials. I love Lifetime. I'd love to do a show on Lifetime. What a wife doesn't know. Right. <laughs> 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 Love that. Yeah, this is a, by the way, this is a great place. We came, Steve and I came here, was, came here once and wa watched um, the old Mike Douglas ones with John Lennon. <laughs> and it, just to watch Mike Douglas call uh, Yoko Ono, Yono. Yono. <laughs> <laughs> and then quickly cut to commercial. Do we have to go? <laughs> <laughs> so, Yono. Uh -huh. Yeah, over there. Did you get an interesting band mail? <laughs> we had asked Jerry on the website at Comedy Central, and how many, Matt, how many e emails did we get? Yeah, probably 10,000 emails. What? At our peak. Amy, someone made a, um, this, this hideous doll that, I, I, I thought it was looked just like her. Um, and made like a, the locker, and it was really elaborate and sent it to her. Mm -hmm. Actual size, like this big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over there. How much did budgetary constraints affect the series? Were there a lot of ideas that you came up with that you had to discard when you were on here? Not really. I don't, I don't really don't think so because Every we now, always felt like... We would just rewrite the scenes. We were not like million dollar writers, like helicopter shot. It didn't have to be like that. And if they had concerns in our... In our uh, we had two different uh, producers, um, Jerry Kupfer and Michelle Armour, who both of them were great would come to us and say, we can't afford, would you really need a, a mechanical bull? <laughs> yeah, we really need a mechanical bull. And they would get it for us. But if they said, does it have to be outside? And we'd say, no, oh, it doesn't. The dad, the dad that affected that um, episode a bit. Yeah, the cougar. Because we, oh, we wanted dad to be eaten by cougars. <laughs> and, uh, oh, right. and they said, yeah, so or we, we, ended up, we ended up with little chihuahuas, I think. It's yeah, some like dogs that they could barely get to, you know, snarl or, or do anything else for that matter. So, yeah, yeah, evidently a cougar is like fifteen thousand dollars because you have to build a containment fence. <laughs> <laughs> Think twice before and we you said, just we powered said, by no. cougar. We said, don't worry, we don't need a containment fence. It's okay. <laughs> it's cable. But they insisted. <laughs> But occasionally, we, you know, we would change scenes that maybe it wasn't going to be in a big uh, auditorium. Instead, it would be in the cafeteria or something. But for yeah. the most part, it wasn't a big issue. It was also became a challenge for us not to end every episode in an auditorium. Right, right. I got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all convening here at this spot to be named. <laughs> I just want to thank all you panelists. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but it just listening to you talk, it just sounds like you all had a ball doing the show and uh, and obviously everyone here had a ball watching it so thank you thank you all Dave. very much <laughs>